Hello, I'm Stephen Childs of virtualvoicelessons.net, and I would like to welcome you to our video lesson entitled Developing Your Vocal Tone Projection. As you may recall, there are three main requirements to achieving good vocal tone. The first one we learned is correct mouth opening. Now to keep the mouth as open as possible without losing the integrity of the vowel does several things. It makes the voice volume louder without any additional work. It makes the voice sound more clear and very importantly, it makes singing generally easier which in and of itself makes the tone sound better because of an overall reduction in straining. Now, the second requirement is to sing with the correct throat opening, which gives us a darker, more bassy tone to our voice. And of course, the rule is, the higher we sing, the more we need to open the throat just to keep it sounding the same. Now, in today's lesson, we're going to look at the third major requirement for good vocal tone, which is adding treble to the voice, or in other words, making it piercing. The way that we achieve this is through a concept commonly referred to as projection. Now projection, what does that mean? Ever since I first started studying voice, there was this term that I constantly heard from singers, as well as just the everyday critics of voice, which again is the term project. You may have also heard someone say, oh, you know, that singer can't project their voice, or, or boy, that singer sure knows how to project. And often, as a young vocalist, I wondered, what exactly did they mean by this? Today, I often ask new students what this term means to them. And it's kind of funny how many people say, well, you know, it, it means this. <laughs> the term project, as it is applied to voice, is yet another idiom that is hard to define but it's often used to describe a vocal feature. And it just cannot simply mean to throw the voice outward, because no matter what, if the voice is heard, it is coming outward. The voice will not come out of our mouth and then go behind us, for instance. Now, the best definition to use for this term, in my opinion, is to aim. When we sit down to watch a film, inside a movie theater. Behind us is a projector that is aiming the film onto the screen. And if the movie were shot all over the theater haphazardly without any care or concern, it would obviously cease to be a projector anymore. Here's another analogy. A missile aimed and then shot at an enemy target is called a projectile. Now, if the missile could fly around anywhere chance would take it, it would cease to be a projectile. It would simply be an explosive because it is not aimed at a specific target. So without the aiming part of the definition, the term project would cease to be accurate in its meaning. Now, does that mean that we have the physical ability to aim our voice once it leaves our mouth? <laughs> Obviously not. Not even ventriloquists can perform such a feat. To project the voice simply means that we're aiming the vocal sound inside of our mouth. And as far as contemporary singing goes, our aiming point, or voice placement as it's called, is in the back of the hard palate. And when we project our voice onto the back of the hard palate, we achieve the third requirement for good vocal tone, which again is treble or piercing tone. Voice placement. Now, here we have yet another term which is often thrown around by voice teachers and even by singers themselves, yet when asked to define it, there's often a lack of clear definition for its usage. You know, one of the best books that I ever read on this subject was from Victor Alexander Fields entitled Training the Singer Voice. I found this book over at Juilliard many years ago and it remains to this day required reading for our interns at Musically Speaking Vocal Science and Performance Studios. What I love so much about this book is that it shows all the different written viewpoints from many of the top vocal masters of the day, 
regarding such topics as voice placement. And you wouldn't believe how vastly different opinions are regarding these common terminologies as well as the development and application of those terminologies. This is one of the very reasons why I set out to at least try and bring out some standard within the field of voice training. So what is voice placement? Voice placement is the point of focus where the vocal sound is maintained, or in other words, it is where the voice is aimed and is kept being aimed consistently throughout the phrase. Now, in contemporary voice, our voice placement is in the back of the hard palate. That is where it's maintained, or in the back of the roof of the mouth. And again, when we do, we wind up with treble in our tone. And if we don't maintain voice placement, our vocal tone will change from being piercing to not being piercing enough to being too piercing. Again, what makes us appear to have control over our voice is to keep it sounding the same to the listener, not having a certain tone one second and then a different sounding tone the next. That would certainly make us sound like we lack control over our voice. Going back to the different opinions that we may hear or read concerning this subject, I feel personally that what may have been lacking in the past amongst early voice teachers was a lack of application of these subjects, such as voice placement, in the field of recording engineering. You know, the more advanced I became as a recording artist, and ultimately as a recording engineer and music producer, the more I realized what was required for us as singers. By understanding what makes one microphone better than another, or how a good preamp or compressor positively affects the voice, really makes the difference in understanding how a singer needs to approach singing. If I'm going to work with a singer as a producer, I must first see if they are recordable. In other words, if their voice is shifting all over the place every other word, how can I successfully record them? Even artists who may be not regarded as excellent vocalists like, like Mick Jagger or Britney Spears at least understand that they need to maintain their voice throughout each phrase. This is what makes them recordable, and that is what voice placement is all about. If we aim or project the voice onto the back of the hard palate at all times, no matter if we're going up or down or singing the vowel A ah or the vowel E, or if we're in falsetto voice or our natural voice, in all conditions, we must remain the same. And the only way to achieve this as far as the bright treble end of the vocal tone spectrum is concerned is to have a point where we aim our voice and for us as contemporary singers it is in the back of the hard palate. That is our projection point. And when you aim the voice there, you will hear a clear, bright ring to your tone that will make you heard over all the other instruments. Your voice will seem to be heard all the way at the end of an auditorium, and it will seem to be louder and more defined. And the basic sound and distinctiveness of your tone will be better heard. The how and why. Now, two questions still remain. How? Do we physically project the voice onto the back of the hard palate? And why does it work? Let's start with the second question first. When we aim the voice onto the back of the hard palate, the vocal sound hits that bone, causing it to vibrate. And the vibrations are of a higher frequency, which is where treble falls within the tonal spectrum. You may remember from our resonance video lesson that this is called sounding board resonance. Sympathetically, the soft palate will then raise as well, which causes it to stiffen and adds yet another hard surface to bounce off of. The lifting also releases tension off of the larynx, a very important plus for us as singers. The less tension, of course, the better. You can feel the soft palate sort of suck back 
when we raise it, which is a feeling that you want to remember while singing in general. Some teachers of voice only describe achieving the piercing sound by raising the soft palate, which does work well for some, but unfortunately is not the full picture. Now, the reason why the shape, density, and positioning of this bone is so perfectly tuned to cause the piercing quality and why does lifting the salt palate not only make the voice ring better, while at the same time reduces strain on the larynx, can only be answered, in my opinion, by saying that it was designed for this purpose. Instrument designers all throughout history have imitated the way the voice functions by adding echo chambers and embouchures into the design of their instruments. So again, to answer the question of why does this approach of projecting in the back of the heart palate work so well? Because it was perfectly designed to enable us to sing with a balanced, full tone of richness and clarity. And this is why I feel that contemporary voice is the true model for all singing. So remember, when we aim in the back of the heart palate, there should sympathetically be a slight raising of the soft palate and this is a feeling that we want to maintain while singing. Now, how about question number one? How do we achieve correct voice placement? Well, the way that we physically aim or project the voice onto the back of the mouth is to simply try and do it. Really, it is ultimately that simple. The mind is an amazing thing when it comes to controlling the physical. Think of comedians who can imitate other actors or singers so perfectly that it leaves us astonished and laughing hysterically. How does the comedian do that? Do they study all the different muscle combinations that shape their vocal tone like some crazy scientist? No, they simply try to do it and eventually they do it. Just like so many of us, who at one point or another made fun of the way someone said something. Oftentimes, we get it just right, even on the first try, especially when it's fresh in our minds. That's our brain's incredible ability to imitate. It's just a matter of trying to send the voice in the back of the mouth and remembering the feeling when we do. And you'll know you did it right when the voice becomes clear piercing and has appeared to become louder. Now this is a perfect time to use your handphones to really hear what you're doing. Stand facing a wall and try sending the sound forward towards that wall, aiming your voice in the back of the mouth with your hands cupped behind your ears. Play with your tone. It'll be like this. Do this with your hands cupped behind your ears. Play with your tone, and through that, you will be able to manipulate your projection points. Now, along with this video lesson, we are providing an audio exercise download that will help you to hear a voice with treble and a voice lacking treble, as well as an exercise to help develop its control. Just a slight warning, I have seen time and time again when I ask a student to project their voice onto the back of the hard palate, they accidentally project more forward. So watch out for this common mistake. If the tone becomes muffled and dull, you probably went the wrong way. So just reverse the feeling. Also another area to be mindful of is when we go down a scale or phrase. Mentally, we often associate the thought of going down a phrase with going forward into our tone, into our nose. So many times in songs, when we are singing high and then drop to a lower note, we will often shoot into the nose by accident. Also, vowels such as ooh are much more difficult to sing unnasal than, say, the ah vowel. Ooh is a struggle for all of us and is considered to be the hardest vowel along with E. So remember that U wants to drift forward into the nose making it nasal. Now E is another vocal sound that wants to go forward but for a different reason than U. 
we squeeze off E so tight that its projection is forced towards nose, once again making it nasal sounding. And by the way, uncontrollable nasalness is what we are constantly fighting against as contemporary singers because it has the tendency to make our voices sound dull and is one of the main reasons we strive to control our voice placement in the first place. A difference of opinion. Now as mentioned before, there are other differing opinions when it comes to the approach and even to the definition of voice placement. One of the most different opinions comes from the world of classical singing. Classical or operatic vocalists not only have a different approach to voice placement, it is 100% opposite to contemporary voice. And this may be the single concept that makes the two art forms sound so different from one another. The voice placement for classical singing is actually forward as opposed to contemporary voice, which again is aimed in the back. They aim their voice in the mask, as they call it, which in their thinking sets the facial bones into vibration and is in another example of sounding board resonance and more importantly, causes reverberation type resonance within the nasal passages. You see, the sinuses also have space and hard walls like a bathroom. And they use this to achieve the tone that is distinctive for their singing style. The one disadvantage I see with this approach is that the opening outside of their bathroom, which again is the nostrils, is too small. And the voice becomes trapped in their face and has a very nasal sound to it but it is the sound that is indicative of classical voice. Now, is this approach wrong? I would definitely say no. It cannot be considered wrong because art is art. And it's hard to say what is wrong about a style of art. But what I will say is that it is not natural. This approach does violate many of the principles regarding sound, such as the fact that sound does not like to be trapped. When it escapes, it will become altered. And this is the very reason why classical singing cannot be said to be natural singing, because it simply does not at all resemble the speaking voice. This fact is inarguable. No one speaks the way a classical singer sings. So if this is how someone wants to sing, that is totally fine, but they should never give the impression that classical singing is the most natural way to sing and that the classical approach to voice training is the best way to train because this is blatantly untrue. So again, no one can say one style of art is the right style and the other is not. If that were the case, what a boring world we would live in. Now we'd like to end today's lesson by reminding you to play with your tone sending the for voice forward like this and then back, back and forth, listening to the change within the timbre of your vocal tone. We do want to maintain a dark but also bright quality at all times whenever we are singing a vocal phrase. I am Stephen Charles of virtualvoicelessons.net. Thank you so much for listening and God bless.